Now that we've discussed group homomorphisms, link in the description to my lesson on that topic, it's time to introduce another really important idea, which is the kernel of a homomorphism. Today we'll go over the definition of a kernel, we'll see an example, and then we'll prove that the kernel of a homomorphism is a normal subgroup of the domain of the homomorphism. Chapters are in the description if you want to skip around the video. Here is the definition of a group homomorphism in case you need to review that and here is the focus the definition of a kernel so we're assuming that f is a homomorphism from a group g to a group h the kernel of that homomorphism f is the set denoted cur of f of all elements of g that's the domain of the homomorphism that the homomorphism maps to the identity of the codomain H. So the homomorphism is from G to H. All elements of G that F maps to the identity of H, that's the kernel of the homomorphism, which is defined here in set builder notation. The kernel of the homomorphism F is all elements from the domain of F, all elements from the group G, the F maps to the identity of H. And that's it. Hopefully you'll agree the definition's not too complicated. Let's jump into an example. Consider this homomorphism phi from the additive group of all real valued functions to the set of real numbers given by this definition. Phi of F, a function from the additive group of real valued functions, is equal to F of zero. So this is our homomorphism. I verify that here. You can review that if you are curious. And then by definition, the kernel of this homomorphism is all functions from the domain of real valued functions such that f of zero is equal to zero. Now remember, the kernel is going to be all elements from the domain, all functions f from the set of real valued functions, all elements from the domain that the homomorphism maps to the identity of the codomain. Now the identity of the codomain is zero because the codomain is the additive group of real numbers. So the identity is zero. So the kernel is going to be all elements of the domain that phi maps to zero. Now what does phi map a function to? Well, if we take a function from the domain and put it into phi, phi maps the function to the image of zero under that function. So if a function maps zero to zero, since zero is the identity of the codomain, that function is going to be in the kernel of the homomorphism because the homomorphism phi maps that function to zero. So here in my set specifying the kernel of the homomorphism, I write f of zero equals zero as the requirement for a function to be in the kernel. Uh, but that's only because phi of f equals f of zero. So perhaps it would help you understand this if I wrote this as phi of f. And I could do that just as well. It means the same thing because again, phi of f is f of zero. And really the point here is that any function that the homomorphism maps to zero, zero being the additive identity of our codomain, any function that phi maps to that identity by definition is in the kernel. Then using words, we could say that the kernel of our homomorphism phi is the set of all real valued functions that pass through the origin, right? A function needs to have zero, zero as a point in order to be in the kernel because the homomorphism will map a function to the image of zero under that function, that image needs to be zero. It needs to be the identity of the codomain in order to be in the kernel. So the kernel is all real valued functions that pass through the origin. And here are some examples of functions that would be in the kernel. These are some functions that pass through the origin. Any function ax, where a is a real number, x squared, and the nth root of x, any function like that, would also be in the kernel. And again, this is because all of these functions satisfy the equation f of zero equals zero, where importantly, f of zero is the image of the function 
under the homomorphism. The homomorphism would map all of these functions to zero, which is the identity of the codomain. So that's what the kernel of a homomorphism is. It's the set of all elements of the domain, G, that the homomorphism maps to the identity of the codomain, H. Let's get into the proof now that the kernel of a homomorphism is a normal subgroup of the domain. Here's statement of the theorem. Let F be a homomorphism mapping the group G to the group H. Then the kernel of F is a normal subgroup. That's what this symbol means. The kernel of F is a normal subgroup of that domain group G. That's what we're going to prove. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson introducing normal subgroups if you need to review. This is what it means. This is what we're going to have to prove for the kernel of F to be a normal subgroup of G. We'll have to prove, of course, that it is a subgroup, but to prove further that it's a normal subgroup, we'll need to prove that it's closed with respect to conjugates, which means for any element A from the kernel, it must be the case that for any element X from the group G, X A X inverse is also in the kernel. That's what we'll have to prove to establish that the kernel is a normal subgroup, though of course we'll first need to prove that it is a subgroup at all. By definition of kernel, we know that the kernel of the homomorphism F is a subset of the domain G, since it's just all elements of G that F maps to the identity of H, so we don't have to write that out. Certainly the kernel of F is a subset of G. Now let's take two arbitrary elements, A and B, from the kernel of F. We'll need to show that their product is also in the kernel in order to show that it's closed. We'll need to show that the inverse of the arbitrary element A is in the kernel to show that it's closed with inverses also. That will establish that the kernel is a subgroup. Then we'll need to prove that it's closed with respect to conjugates to establish that it's a normal subgroup. And all of these things are fairly easy. So we take these two arbitrary elements, let's show their product is also in the kernel. To show the product AB is in the kernel, we need to show that the homomorphism F maps AB to the identity of H, and that's pretty straightforward. So let's consider F of AB. Well, since F is a homomorphism, F of AB equals F of A times F of B. But A and B are both from the kernel, so F of A equals the identity of H, and F of B equals the identity of H. The identity times the identity, of course, is the identity. So what we see is the homomorphism F maps AB to the identity of H. Thus, by definition, AB is an element of the kernel. Now we need to show the kernel is closed with respect to inverses. So we take this arbitrary element A from the kernel and consider F of A inverse. We need to show that F maps A inverse to the identity of H in order to establish that A inverse is in the kernel. Now we've previously proven, link in the description, a basic property of homomorphisms is that they map inverses to inverses. So the image of the inverse of A is the inverse of the image of A. But F of A, since A is in the kernel, is the identity of H. So F of A inverse is the identity of H inverse, but the inverse of the identity is the identity. And so we see that F of A inverse is the identity, thus by definition, A inverse is an element of the kernel. So the kernel is closed with respect to products and inverses. It is a subgroup of G. Now we just need to prove that it's a normal subgroup. And let me just say one more time, this first step, F of A inverse equals F of A inverse, is a basic property of homomorphisms. You can prove it yourself pretty easily or check the description for a link to my lesson proving it. All right, let's move on to this last step. We're going to take an arbitrary element X from G, and we need to show that X a x inverse is in the kernel. Remember, a is still just an arbitrary element from the kernel. And in order to show that x a x inverse is in the kernel, we'll need to show that f of x a x inverse is the identity of H. So we consider F of X A X inverse. Since this is a homomorphism, this is equal to F of X times F of A times F of X inverse. By this same inverse property we used before, this is equal to F of X times F of A times F of X 
inverse. But f of a, since a is in the kernel, is the identity. So we can just make the f of a disappear. It's the identity, it's not changing anything. And so what remains is f of x times the inverse of f of x. By definition of inverse, that gives the identity. So we see that f of x a x inverse is the identity. So by definition, x a x inverse is in the kernel of f. And that proves that the kernel of f is a normal subgroup of the domain group g. Now we're quickly heading for a really cool result called the Fundamental Theorem on Homomorphisms. So I hope you'll keep watching and enjoy that when you get there. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. Check out my Abstract Algebra playlist in the description for more. And if you find these lessons helpful, please consider supporting Wrath of Math on Patreon. Link in the description. It's a huge help. See you next time.